Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the, uh, the DevNet Zone. Uh, can you hear me okay? Volume's all right? All right. And uh, so uh, today I'm here to talk to you about open source, open source at Cisco, um, share with you a few things which uh, I think there's a good chance you probably didn't know, yet uh, hopefully there are things that uh, you'll be glad you, you know after the uh, presentation's over. Um, my name is Charles Eckel. I'm one of the developer evangelists in the DevNet team, and one of my areas of, uh, uh, I guess one of the areas I'm passionate about is open source. Uh, hopefully some of you have the same uh, passion I do, and, and maybe that's why you're here in the audience today. Uh, briefly go over the agenda. So, um, and there is more information in the uh, PDF that will be posted afterwards than what I'm going to cover in this talk. It's, we only have 30 minutes, so I'm going to go through just pretty high-level information. But uh, uh, take a look at the PDF. There will be more in there. So first of all, why open source? Why are we interested in it? Is it a good thing, bad thing, and why? Uh, open source at Cisco let you know some of the places where Cisco is very active in open source and um, where we're using it within our products. Uh, Cisco DevNet, so um, you've, obviously you've heard about DevNet, you're here, but we have resources specifically in DevNet to help you with navigating this landscape of open source and how Cisco is using it uh, to make it more approachable and available to you as a developer. And then a few key takeaways I'll leave you with. So, first of all, this is just my idea of what me, might be a problem that uh, you've encountered. Now, how many people here are like uh, more network administrators or, or system integrators, that type of, and how many just consider themselves like application developers? Okay, so, so maybe this diagram won't apply to you as much. I talk about taking different applications, servers, and network components and putting them together. For you, it might be more an application where you have multiple uh, interfaces, interfacing into components from uh, different uh, vendors that have provided. Um, some of those would be proprietary interfaces, perhaps some of them are even standard protocols or interfaces, but the, uh, the implementations of those standards might actually have some variations within them that cause you some grief. But anyways, you're pretty sharp. You glue this stuff together. You figure out what you need to do to get it working. And eventually, you have some system that, that more or less works for you. And you know, hey, that's great. You know, your, your code's working. It's doing whatever it's supposed to do. You're pretty happy about that. Uh, now, some time goes by. And over time, for one reason or another, you find it's important to upgrade. Perhaps there are some new features you want to be bringing in. Um, security vulnerabilities that have been fixed, you want to bring that in. So you try to bring in this code, and uh, the problem you run into is now some of this glue logic that you put in before to make the components work uh, together, um, all of a sudden it's not quite right. Things have changed a little bit, and your system's broken, you got to go through and figure that all out, and it's a real big hassle. So now you're not happy. Um, so I want to suggest what, what I think is a better uh, way forward, a better path forward. And I think it, the real key to it is engaging in open source. Uh, again, my very simple diagrams here. I'm starting out with this box is uh, my representation of the code base open source project. And the idea here is that Cisco will go and contribute into that open source project. And we'll contribute some code that's important to us and similarly, other vendors will go and contribute some functionality um, that's important to them. You yourself can contribute in the open source project. You're contributing into uh, the code base there. Now, where this really gets exciting, I think, is where Cisco takes that open source product or project and incorporates it into its a product that it's providing. And another vendor does that as well. And the great thing here is that now all of a sudden this interface, which gave you problems before, because the interface, you know, different implementations of it or non-standard interfaces, now all of a sudden we're actually using the same code. It's the exact same implementation. It's the one we worked on together in the open source community. So you just get much better functionality uh, across these components. And 
now you, you win and hopefully you're, you're happier for a much longer time uh, than you were in the previous slide. So now, I mentioned we'd also talk about why open source. And the first thing a lot of people think of is, you know, oh, it's free. Hey, that's great, which is usually true. You can just go download it for free. And um, as I'm sure many of you know, that that's not really the big driver for open source. And at the end of the day, although you, it's really not free. You may have not paid any licensing up front, but, but it's not free. You need to invest time and effort in coming up to speed on this. Uh, you may even need to pay for um, some services or training, and, and that's going to cost you money. So you really need to think about the total cost of ownership. And in this next slide, I just want to go through what are some of the uh, evaluation criteria you might use. And from the perspective of, of a developer, what you, will you be looking for? Uh, first of all, some of the, the advantages of open source. And I think this first one, visibility, um, this one to me is really the most important thing. Um, you can see all the code. It's right there. You can see exactly how it works. Even if you have no intention of ever changing the code, of ever contributing anything back to the community, just the fact that you can see it and really understand how it's working is very valuable. When you run into a problem, you can you know, step through a debugger. You can see exactly what the code's doing. You can stick your own uh, uh, debug statements in there and then run it again and see what's happening. It's just that transparency, that visibility is, is very important. Uh, faster pace of innovation. With these open source projects, you have people from very different, uh, different companies, different backgrounds working on uh, the code. You're not uh, held back to whatever the release cycle is of, of you know, one given vendor and when they get around to doing something. And uh, then also you have the ability to influence uh, what goes into that code base from contributing to code yourself, to going to uh, community forums, talking about functionality that needs to be there, submitting bug reports, maybe even submitting fixes. All this is good stuff. Now the cons that you should keep in mind is that in order to get a lot of this benefit that I'm talking about out of the open source software, you're going to have to have knowledge of that open source software. You're going to have to understand uh, and be experienced with the programming language it's written in. You're going to have to understand the paradigm behind it and how it works. Otherwise, you don't really get the benefit of seeing it if you don't really deeply understand it. It's only with that understanding that you really get the power of it. Um, deployment complexity. So open source software is generally meant to run across a whole bunch of different platforms, right? So what that means is that it's not going to be necessarily tailored and packaged in a way that makes it real simple to deploy uh, on your hardware or in your environment. You may need to tailor that a bit so that it works. And then you, you definitely need to be aware of um, the licensing and what that means for you and perhaps if you know, the company at which you work, um, the implications of using this open source software. So you need to keep that in mind too. Now on the right hand side, these are just some uh, some traits that I think are really desirable when you're looking at an open source um, uh, project and some more open source code and considering whether or not you're going to use it. The first one's pretty obvious, right? It needs to effectively solve your problem. If it doesn't, you know, really no point in going any further. Assuming it does, then you really want to have a look at the code quality. You want to make sure that it's something that you or your team has the technical skills to work with so that you can get all these benefits that I was mentioning over here. Um, it's important that the licensing is agreeable to you. This alignment with standards, I think, is important. But really, the best of both worlds is when the open source project is aligned with standards. You don't have to wait for the standard to become a fully adopted, say, RFC or, or uh, fully blessed by whatever standard organization is moving it forward. You're using the code as the standard is being developed, but then you, you know that this implementation, this, this open source project is going to be implementing the standard. It's backed by a standard, so you don't have to worry about it getting forked in a bunch of different places where maybe you'd run into problems later on. Uh, it doesn't need to be a standard, but I just think that's the best of both worlds when open source and standards come together. Uh, development community, of course, it's very important to have a good development community behind it. Commercial support may be important to you. Um, I think you'll find that 
with open source software, oftentimes the development community are, are working on it, um, they're fantastic in terms of support. People are passionate about it, so when you post a question, people are very, very helpful, very forthcoming with information. But still, you may need something more than that, right? If, if you're using this for something mission critical, you may need like 24-7, uh, someone you can call when there's a problem. Th th you're not going to get that from the open source community. So in those cases, it may be important that um, commercial support, it, that there's at least an option to get it if you need it. And all, all this really, uh, uh, you know, the commercial support, any training, the skills, I think that all just goes into the total cost of ownership, and you need to consider that. So now I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about open source at Cisco. So uh, I list some projects up here that you're probably familiar with. This is not meant to be an exhaustive list. All I'm showing you is that really from the time Cisco started as a company back in, in the uh, 80s until now, um, Cisco's been heavily using, contributing to uh, open source from many different uh, projects. And you know, I would even go so far as to say that uh, every single product that Cisco has today has at least some open source in it. Um, yeah, some of them are even all open source, or at least almost all open source. Now I want to go through a, a few examples which um, you've, you've probably heard uh, information about them here at, at Cisco Live and uh, hopefully are top of mind to you. So how many of you are familiar with OpenStack? Okay, great. So I'm not going to go into great details of what OpenStack is. There's been some great talks by uh, Rohit, just actually gave a really good one. Uh, Shannon had a more in-depth session. Um, but OpenStack, it's a cloud computing platform for public and private clouds. The idea is that you abstract away these data center concepts of resources and uh, make them available in a very scalable, elastic uh, manner. The, the most important thing, I think, from a developer point of view is these APIs. Uh, OpenStack's written with REST-based APIs that's used from all the various components within it to talk to each other. Well, because it's open source, all those exact same APIs are available to you as a developer. And uh, I think that's very powerful. You can uh, interact with the OpenStack uh, software at any level using those APIs. Uh, and Cisco's contributing uh, quite extensively to the OpenStack community. Uh, you wouldn't be surprised to, uh, to find that um, you know, Cisco being a networking company, one area in which we contribute quite heavily is uh, to the Neutron networking component, but that's not the only component we contribute to. Also contribute to Cinder and Solometer, Horizon, um, some other uh, projects within the OpenStack community. Um, we've helped add IPv6 support to it and uh, a very active member in that community. On the engineering side, what I'm getting at are things that Cisco has done to make Cisco products work better with OpenStack. So these tend to be more, you know, whereas all this, the stuff in the community participation has been given back to the community, the stuff in the engineering part is really more Cisco specific, so it's not necessarily, uh, um, uh, while it's, it's available to you, it's not necessarily part of the OpenStack project uh, proper. So those are plugins for various Cisco products to work better. I mentioned Nexus, CSR, ASR, um, APIC. Those are just some examples of, of products where we have specific plugins to make them work with the OpenStack uh, Neutron component. Um, the ironic plugin for UCS, that's something that came out very recently. Um, that's so that the UCS manager is able to manage bare metal um, uh, UCS servers uh, within an OpenStack deployment. Uh, we're also working with partners and customers on these Cisco validated designs. Um, one thing I wanted to make clear, Cisco doesn't have its own distribution of OpenStack. Um, there was maybe some thoughts of doing that at one point, but that's not being done. Instead, what we're doing is working very closely with Red Hat and other, um, 
others with uh, distributions of OpenStack to make sure that their distributions work well on, on UCS and, and work well with Cisco products. So we don't have our own uh, distribution. And then in terms of cloud services, Cisco has various offerings uh, that are OpenStack related. UCSO, that's essentially um, OpenStack on UCS servers. MetaCloud is um, basically private cloud as a service that's offered uh, by Cisco. We acquired a MetaCloud uh, a little while back. Cisco Cloud Services, that's more of a service provider offering. You can get uh, public uh, cloud services from them. Project Squared I mentioned because that's a, a product that Cisco has and we're running it on, on CCS. So that's just an example of a, a Cisco service that we offer that's, that's running um, in a cloud environment. So now I'll switch to Open Daylight. Open Daylight's another example of a, a big open source uh, project. Uh, people here familiar with Open Daylight? Okay, N not as much familiarity with that. It's more on the networking side. It's really an um, open source project for software-defined networking. And uh, again, I, I mean, you could do like a whole probably a couple hour presentation. Um, I don't know if you can see all these boxes on the, uh, the left-hand side, but the, the, it, really the, it, it's pretty simple. At the core, the, there's this modular core. And then to you as an application developer, what's probably important is its northbound API. That's really pro provides the platform on which you can build applications. So you talk to the controller through the northbound API describing the needs of your application from a network perspective. And then it has these southbound interfaces to all the network devices underneath it. And those could be virtual network devices, those could be physical network devices. You don't really care. It just abstracts away all the details. Could be Cisco devices, could be some other vendors' devices. Um, it talks with them through a, a whole variety of different um, interfaces that it has. And that's really the power of the, the controllers, abstracting away all that network details away from you, but still letting you take full advantage of the capabilities of the network underneath you. And Cisco is contributing very heavily to uh, open daylight as well. This is just an example that I pulled down from Spectrometer. I just plugged in for the Helium re release, which is the latest release of Open Daylight, just to show, uh, obviously, Cisco's contributing to it heavily, but so, so are many other uh, companies. It's really a great uh, community project that's being moved forward. And Open Daylight actually forms the basis of um, Cisco's OpenSDN controller. So now, in contrast to what I said about OpenStack, where we don't have our own distribution, in this case, we actually do have our own distribution, and that's what we call the OpenSDN controller. Uh, what it is is our commercial distribution of open daylight. So if you, the way to read this slide is if you look on the left-hand side, uh, everything in this bubble here, th that's all, those are all the components of the open daylight project as of the Helium release, whereas on the right-hand side, that's everything that's in Cisco's OpenSDN controller. This uh, kind of grayish box now in the middle, that shows you that there's quite a bit of overlap. That's why we're contributing very heavily into this project, is because there's a lot of common content that we use. We take directly from Open Daylight and put it into the OpenSDN controller. And what you see added to the right-hand side, if you take a look at it, most of it's about making this a hardened, mission-critical platform. Uh, logging, metrics, monitoring, central management, a lot of things that you need there, an OVA distribution. That's just to make it so that it's very easy for you to do uh, a one-click install uh, of Open Daylight. Um, the plugin uh, clustering for uh, HA, and then developer uh, support provided through DevNet, resources on it, and, and also help if you have questions. Um, those are all important aspects of the OpenSDN controller. One other example I wanted to mention of Open Daylight being used within a Cisco product. Um, this is WAY, the, the WAN automation engine. And that again is a very uh, kind of complicated, powerful uh, product that we could spend a lot of time talking about. But really I just wanted to point out one thing to you. It, um, 
and that's its integration with Open Daylight. You can see through the Deployer API, that's how uh, the WAN Automation Engine uses OpenStack actually uh, to talk to the physical and virtual network underneath it. Just like I showed you before, the Open Daylight uh, platform, I mentioned it was very good at abstracting away all the details of the network and uh, interfacing in with a bunch of different network components. The WAN Automation Engine uh, uses Open Daylight to do exactly that. Now just uh, very briefly, a few other open source uh, projects that, that you may find of interest that Cisco is very heavily involved in. Snort, this is open source uh, intrusion detection and prevention software, rule-based um, language it provides to let you uh, detect uh, malware threats and uh, other problems. But what's really powerful that, about that is uh, in its open source nature is that you can uh, create your own rules, you can modify rules, you can benefit from all the rules that have already been contributed into the community uh, and uh, then verify that uh, a given rule that already exists in the community that it meets the vulnerability you're worried about. This is an open source project. Cisco actually acquired uh, SourceFire and, and the Snort technology, but it's remaining open source. And uh, there's no intention of, of uh, changing that. It, it will remain a, an open source project. Open H264, how many of you have heard of this one? OK, more people. So this is Cisco's H264 uh, video codec implementation for real-time video. If you look at, uh, if you're familiar with WebEx, it's the H.264 video codec that it uses. Cisco's not only made that available via open source uh, with some binary um, modules that you can download to implement it, but uh, what's perhaps equally important or maybe more important to some people is Cisco off also covers the licensing costs for you. And the real reason for doing that is, you know, I mentioned up in the first bullet that uh, WebRTC is an example where this might be used. So if you think of browsers, like you know, Mozilla, Firefox, Chrome, every time those get downloaded, there would be licensing costs associated with it if they ship H.264 with it. That's a real blocker to the uh, WebRTC community to adopt H.264. So Cisco made this freely available to remove that roadblock and enable uh, the WebRTC community to benefit from using H.264 as a video codec. And then one last example here, Let's Encrypt. This one's pretty new. How many of you heard about this one? OK. So this one hasn't appeared in any products yet. In fact, uh, it, it's not quite ready for prime time yet. But it, it's an open source uh, certificate authority. The idea is to really bolster the use of TLS, uh, HTTPS, uh, security, and um, not only is the certificate authority open source, but it's freely available server side or whatever uh, certificates that you need. So that when you stand up your web service or, or whatever server you have, it makes it very easy and free for you to get a legitimate certificate. So you don't need, you know, go the route of just not securing your service or using a self-signed certificate. This is going to uh, help you tremendously with that. Uh, there's an open protocol that it uses called Acme. The initial release is out. You can go take a look at it. And there's a developer list um, where you can go and work with that community. So, so this is great. I just told you about all these different open source projects. Cisco's using them heavily uh, in their products. But uh, the problem is, what does that mean to you as a developer? How do you, how do you benefit from any of that? And that's where DevNet comes in. So within DevNet, what we do is we bring all these resources available to you. Um, we help you or enable you to understand where Cisco's using open source, how it's used in the product, how you can interact with the Cisco developers who are using it, where we're working publicly within the community on something, where we have stuff that's being kind of incubated internally before going into the community, give you visibility into all that and uh, to make it easier for you to navigate between the, um, the community and the internal Cisco uh, developers that are working with it. There's forms for you to ask questions, uh, arrange for meetings. Uh, the sandbox is, is really powerful. If you haven't seen that yet, 
you can go try out different technologies there. The idea is that you can create your application and test it out working in a, a live network with other Cisco gear and make sure that it really works the way you, you think it should work without having to buy any equipment or set up a lab to do that yourself. And then uh, finally I mentioned the hackathons. That's where we bring the Cisco engineers working on the technology uh, right in the same room with you and for 24 hours or however long the hackathon is, we, we you know, try to take the interfaces and the products that are there and, and put some cool stuff together. Um, we just had one this week and um, there was a bunch of prize money. Guys came up with a really cool design, this uh, pillbox idea with, uh, to automate um, some, with your medication and communicating with your doctor. Yeah, it was pretty cool for a 24-hour project. But that's the type of thing we want to um, really promote, and I think open source just makes that easier and more powerful uh, for us to engage in those types of activities. So I know that was pretty quick and high level in terms of open source stuff at Cisco, but like I said, there's more on the slides and uh, there's going to be much more uh, growing amount of content in the DevNet um, portal over time. But uh, we do have a few minutes for any questions, if you have any. Yeah. So I said uh, open source leads to faster development pace, but what's the question? The question is how do we then secure the, the resources to do that development? How do you secure the resources to do that development? So there's a couple ways to do it. If it's within your own company, you can contribute some of your own resources right, to the open source project if there's really specific content that you want. So just to give you an example with OpenStack, um, there's about 1,900 like, active developers right now working on it. And at Cisco, I think we have 50 or so, maybe a little more developers really actively contributing as essentially their full-time job to OpenStack. So, so we have 50 developers contributing to it, really most of them working on things that are very important to Cisco, and we get benefit from that but we have 1,850 other developers that are working on all kinds of stuff. Now, some of it's not important to us, but a lot of it is. Adding new features, stabilizing the platform, and that's really the benefit that you get, that huge multiplier of, in, in our case, what is that? About a 20 times multiplier for every resource we get the community puts in. So. I think securing resources, yeah, you still need to spend time with the software. If it's something very special and you want to make sure it gets in there, you probably have to put in some effort on your own. But you have the whole rest of that community contributing code, bug fixes, reviewing code. All that just allows it to move much, much quicker. Uh, any other questions? Okay, well thank you very much for, uh, for attending and, and staying awake this late in the afternoon. Um, and I'm here for any, uh, if you wanna talk uh, about anything afterwards too. Be, be happy to do that. Uh, thanks a lot.